The end of the Cold War made milestone disarmament treaties possible. As a result, tanks that are no longer needed get scrapped in Central Europe. Yet many old disputes and new threats keep the world hungry for tanks that speed onto the arenas of arms markets. Demands for arms control clash with demands for more weapons in a time of change and uncertainty. How can arms control become possible? The missile will be launched now in 15 seconds. The political and ideological domination of the Cold War obscured many age-old regional disputes. Now they are re-emerging with a vengeance. This creates new risks for violence and war. Today, anyone can shop for weapons among a vast array of brand new conventional arms. Even weapons of mass destruction are available, adding to the enormous arsenals that are a legacy of the arms race that began 50 years ago. You can't really explain why both sides built up such massive forces of both conventional and nuclear arms, except for the fact that there was this, this fear. See, for many years, we feared a combination of China and the Soviet Union. That's how we got into the Vietnam War, to try and contain China. And the Soviet Union, I think, recognized that they had no friends. They were in a hostile world, and they felt their only safety came in amassing great quantities of arms. A real breakthrough took place in 1985, when President Reagan and President Gorbachev met in Geneva. Now, up to that time, President Reagan had shown no interest at all in arms control. But that meeting made a big change. I think that he saw this, you know, jolly little fellow with a big smile and a funny birthmark. And he felt, this is somebody we can do business with. And that changed President Reagan's approach. And from that point on, Considerable progress was made in the arms control talks. We are witnessing the emergence of a new historic reality, a turning away from the principle of super armament to the principle of reasonable defense sufficiency. We are present at the birth of the new model of ensuring security, not through the buildup of arms, as was almost always the case in the past, but on the contrary, through the reduction on the basis of compromise. The doomsday clock is being turned back. Missile silos built to survive a nuclear blast are dismantled in the United States and in the former Soviet Union. The thawing of the Cold War was marked by momentous disarmament treaties between the United States and Russia. They cover strategic and tactical nuclear weapons, as well as delivery systems, such as long-range missiles. The SALT Agreement and START 1 and 2 would reduce the number of strategic nuclear warheads by at least 70 percent. These reductions would leave Russia and the United States with 3,500 warheads each by the turn of the century. Hundreds of nuclear warheads have to be dismantled each year, an expensive and often dangerous undertaking. The core of the bomb yields highly enriched uranium and plutonium, among the most toxic substances on Earth. How to store and dispose of these materials so that they can never be used to make another bomb is a formidable challenge. Even as warheads roll away, menacing and unforeseen scenarios involving nuclear weapons emerge across the globe. The steppes of Central Asia. The former Soviet Union used Kazakhstan as one of its main nuclear testing sites. Over 500 nuclear explosions were carried out where today sheep graze on radioactive grass. 
the true price of the nuclear arms race to human health and the environment is only now beginning to be uncovered here and in other countries. With the breakup of the Soviet Union, the control of nuclear weapons stockpiled in Kazakhstan and other Soviet republics became a major and alarming international issue. Since 1970, an international treaty has guarded against the spread of nuclear weapons to countries beyond the original nuclear weapon states, the United States, Russia, Great Britain, France, and China. Inspectors of the International Atomic Energy Agency, IAEA, routinely visit nuclear installations in the over 160 countries that are party to the treaty. I think it's a very contentious issue whether nuclear weapons can be acquired only by the five big powers which already have it and they should keep their monopoly or whether other countries have a right to have access to nuclear technology. I think if nuclear weapons get into the hands of additional states, there is more and more chance of regional conflict. There is more and more chance that terrorist groups, subnational groups, can pick up nuclear weapons and use them for nuclear blackmail. After the Gulf War, evidence was found that Iraq had developed a nuclear weapons program in violation of the non-nuclear proliferation treaty it had signed. However, Iraq is not the only country with nuclear weapon ambitions that could set the doomsday clock ticking forward once again. As technology spreads, more countries get this kind of ability to produce weapons. Uh, and so there's a greater risk, I think, in the international community now than ever before that these weapons will be more widely available. The unique circumstances following the Gulf War made it possible for the international community to undo Iraq's nuclear weapons program. One of the world's largest airplanes brought in equipment for removing Iraq's irradiated nuclear fuel. In Iraq, radioactive rods from a civilian nuclear facility were buried in this field. Now, inspectors from the International Atomic Energy Agency oversee removal of these items and their shipment for permanent disposal elsewhere. Spent fuel that has been removed from a civilian nuclear reactor can be reprocessed for use in weapons. The violations unearthed in Iraq exposed an urgent need to strengthen the methods used to verify and safeguard that nuclear weapons do not spread. New technology never before used in arms control is operated to monitor weapons in Iraq. The crew is searching for Scud missiles that may have been stored underground. As the radar cones scan a designated area, any buried metal items will show up on a monitor. Based on the information from the radars, inspection teams on the ground know exactly where to go to look, sometimes with some extra help from a pilot's mirror. Ground 4 1, this is Gold 1. Gold 1, it's 4 1, go ahead. Do uh, you have any complaints concerning the mirror working over? Constant vigilance is needed to control existing nuclear weapons and prevent secret nuclear programs. The end of the Cold War reduced the nuclear threat significantly, but by no means eliminated it entirely. The doomsday clock is ticking, but much slower than before. King of the battlefield, 
huge forces of conventional weapons were deployed on the east-west divide in Europe for more than five decades. A milestone charter outlining a new Europe put an end to a divided Europe and the Warsaw Pact military alliance. This tank is among the 125,000 pieces of armaments designated to the scrap heap of history. We have a treaty in Europe to reduce the armed forces and the equipment of the armed forces. And as a result, tens of thousands of tanks, for example, are available now. And what is being done is to uh, destroy them or to convert them for non-military use. For example, tanks are converted into, into heavy cranes, into earth-moving equipment. But even as they disappear in Central Europe, tanks are being used with lethal effect elsewhere. New ethnic and nationalist conflicts that long remained masked by the intrigues of the Cold War are breaking out all over the world. The international community is often called to the rescue and asked to resolve the conflicts while at the same time, huge quantities of conventional weapons continue flowing into the areas. Ironically, the five members of the UN Security Council have been the principal traders in international arms. So that has to stop. One crazy part about it is that to the extent that we and the United Nations wants to intervene to try and restrain bloodshed, within countries or between countries. Our problem is rendered infinitely greater by the fact that we are facing now the weapons that we sold. The tank is powered by a 1,500 horsepower multi-fuel turbine engine. Each year, there are dozens of exhibits and defense shows all over the world. In Abu Dhabi, thousands of exhibitors display their latest products and services to military buyers and visitors from more than 30 countries. This is the only arms show where the weapons are actually demonstrated. It is difficult to distinguish between arms trade for legitimate defense needs, such as replacing outdated systems, and arms trade that will provoke and threaten a neighbor. But a new UN arms register makes arms sales public and helps build confidence among nations. Now we know by official statements from governments, this is what we have got. There are no wrong intentions to do that. Um, so that's what is called transparency, knowing what my neighbor is doing. If you know what your neighbor has, you don't have the suspicion of overarming yourself over your neighbor. It's better we build confidence, we have confidence building measures so that we don't start an arms race and can be free to spend our money on important social problems. Annual reports on arms exports and imports are entered into a database at the United Nations Register on Conventional Arms. This information will be available to all. The register is meant to foster confidence between nations. Eventually, this could lead to real arms control and possibly disarmament. The Kalashnikov assault rifle, the AK-47, was introduced in the late 1940s. Not only has it equipped formal armies, 
It has been used to fight revolutions on many continents. At 70, its designer, Mikhail Kalashnikov, is still going strong. Perhaps some uh, thought that there was not yet uh, Mr. Kalashnikov, but he is alive. This is the new design of hand machine gun with the night sight. You don't need any tools to strip the whip. You can use three types of links. The British link, the American link and the German link. It is very easy to assemble. It is a gas-operated weapon. It is not vulnerable for dust and sandy conditions. But it is a very dangerous toy. Okay, very dangerous. <laughs> Small arms like machine guns, uh, like um, uh, mortars, like mines, all of these kind of things that are used in present day conflicts in the world are not part of the register. And these kind of items that are not covered are really troublesome because they are used in conflicts. Most of the conflicts in the last uh, 45 years since the Second World War took place on the soil of the developing world. 127 conflicts from Vietnam, Korea, to Afghanistan, to Nicaragua. And 22 million people died, more than in the Second World War, but in the developing world. Central America was the scene of several of these proxy wars. Insurrectional movements and irregular forces both armed from sources east and west, kept the area a constant battlefield for well over a decade. If we think that it is immoral for the poor countries to sell drugs to rich nations in order to poison the youth in the industrialized world, for me it is also immoral for rich nations to keep on with the uh, exportation of arms to poor nations in the South. Finally, a complex peace agreement was implemented under UN supervision. Demobilization here meant that the former fighters actually gave up their arms, an unprecedented act of reconciliation. Carbines dating from the First World War, as well as modern machine guns, end up on the chopping board. The voluntary destruction of tanks and rifles is an exception in a world that thrives on weapons. But each case shows that disarmament is possible when steps are taken that establish mutual trust. Converting defense industries to civilian manufacturing is a global challenge. In Russia, it has a very special urgency. Now that the production of weapons has been drastically cut here, enterprises that produce arms have to be transformed. Here in St. Petersburg, the ancient hope of turning swords into plowshares is becoming a reality. Tools that once made cannons now make samovars and other consumer items. <laughs> the estimated 15 million defense workers in the world face massive job losses. New alternatives are needed to avoid social and economic disasters. It's not easy to change a factory 
or a plant, or even a concern, for that matter, even an economy, that uh, a great deal of its production is made of a weapon system uh, to entirely different things. So the conversion is painful. During the Cold War, foreigners were not allowed anywhere near this aerospace enterprise, the largest in Russia. Here, rockets were made to launch warheads. Now, international visitors are welcomed, and the same rockets are offered to former adversaries for peaceful purposes. Paris, January 1993. After two decades of negotiations, a universal ban on chemical weapons is at last being signed. This is the first attempt ever made to eliminate an entire weapons type lock, stock, and barrel. The League of Nations outlawed the use of chemical weapons in 1925. However, the Geneva Protocol left a loophole that allowed the production of these pernicious weapons to continue. And continue it did. One country after another acquired and amassed chemical armaments. The first documented violation of the Geneva Protocol occurred in 1988 when Iraq used chemical bombs on its Kurdish minorities. More than 5,000 civilians were left dead after an attack on the town of Halabsha. Some 20 countries are currently believed to possess chemical weapons and many more have the capacity to produce them. Even their storage poses enormous hazards to people and the environment. Representatives from over 100 nations signed the Chemical Weapons Convention in Paris. The treaty finally bans their use and prohibits their development, production, and stockpiling. It also calls for their destruction, an enormous undertaking. The same chemicals that are used in fertilizers can also be used to make chemical weapons. Myriad compounds found in drugstore products, from shampoos to pharmaceuticals, can be diverted to illegal uses. All of these substances will be closely controlled. The Chemical Weapons Convention, in order to be successful, had to address not only the military side of things, but also the commercial side of things. In other words, a widespread chemical industry all over the world is going to be monitored under this treaty. It's, it's an endeavor that's never been attempted before. The world's stockpiles of chemical weapons have to be destroyed in an environmentally safe way, a Herculean an extremely costly enterprise. Although nations have agreed to ban chemical weapons from the face of the earth, they are still perceived as a threat, creating a market for protective gear at arms bazaars such as Abu Dhabi. There is one cheap and totally uncontrolled weapon that has turned large areas of the world into permanent danger zones. A landmine should be really be thought of as a weapon of mass destruction in slow motion. Like strategic weapons, like weapons of mass destruction, they're aimed at civilians most of the time. That the use of landmines nowadays in most conflicts is not aimed at military installations. It's generally aimed at moving civilian populations around to destroy the base of agriculture so that a group is forced to move on as refugees. Landmines do an enormous amount of damage to an entire economy. Uh, in the first place, of course, they blow up people, and they 
leave them not just dead, but very often uh, invalids with uh, legs missing, limbs missing. And the consequence of this for an economy and for a whole society is devastating. Cambodia is certainly one of the worst places in the world, but Afghanistan is also stunningly uh, infested. Uh, Angola, Mozambique, Somalia, uh, Iraqi Kurdistan. There are still large portions of uh, Kuwait and Iraq left over from the war that are still strewn with mines. Min. There is no technology out there for detecting even many of the metal mines in the ground. And so you don't know. The only way to truly know whether, in fact, you've got an area clear of mines is to proceed a few centimeters at a time, poking a stick into the ground a few centimeters going forward, not poking too far, because if you touch the top of the mine, you'll probably set it off. So you want to rub right up against the side of the mine and locate it. And then you have to take very, very great care in scooping around the mine to remove it or else place a charge in or some way to, to blow it up, usually. Mines are a very cheap weapon. They can cost as little as three dollars, but removing them can cost as much as a thousand. The goal has to be a total ban on these small weapons of mass destruction. Nations will always need to provide for their legitimate self-defense. In a climate of mutual trust, spending in excess of this would not be necessary. The hope of disarmament is for the world to reach agreement on when enough is enough. We need to understand that uh, we have to rely more on security of people, security of employment, security for the environment, and less on military security. And that the real challenges that confront humanity are illiteracy, disease, uh, increasing inequality, environmental degradation, uh, terrorism, and certainly more corruption and more poverty. So unless we address those uh, threats, those challenges, and uh, successfully fight all these uh, challenges, we'll be able to uh, inherit it to our children a peaceful uh, world for the 21st century.